These were the younger siblings of the California 60s sound living in an 80s punk rock world. They were the most popular group to emerge from LA's Paisley underground movement, but their seemingly overnight success was years in the making. This is a story of how sisters Vicky and Debbie Peterson, Susanna Hoffs, and Michael Steele became the bangers. The road to becoming the Bangles was pretty long and winding. It went through dozens of band members, many, many band name changes. But I think the real story uh, begins with Vicki Peterson. And Vicki and her younger sister Debbie grew up in the San Fernando Valley. They went to high school in the more Tony Palos Verdes Estates. Vicki has described herself as that sometimes annoying kid who brought her guitar with her to every sleepover and party. And instead of the popular music of the day, she was drawn more towards the 60s music that her older sister, Pam, had gotten her into. So not long after graduating in 1976, Vicky persuaded her younger sister, Debbie, to start playing the drums. And that soon morphed into a trio called The Muse with a Z. They played various clubs a couple times a week and they'd intersperse originals with songs like My Boyfriend's Back. Uh, but they crossed paths with bands like The Knack and the Angry Samoans, and in 1980 had changed her name yet again to Those Girls. But as the year was coming to an end, Debbie, and particularly Vicky, were worried that unless they found the right combination of musicians, uh, the scene was just going to pass them by. Susanna Hoffs, or Sue as she was known back then, grew up on LA's west side. She went to high school at Pacific Palisades High. She went to college up at UC Berkeley in the San Francisco Bay Area. But she also played with her sometimes boyfriend and ex-neighbor, David Roback. And uh, David Roback would go on to form Mazzy Starr. And their music harkened a lot more towards what Mazzy Starr sounded like than what the Bangles would sound like. So by the time Susanna had graduated college up in Berkeley, uh, she came back down here to LA and was living with her parents and had become completely enamored with the local scene here that included bands like The Last doing punkified versions of 60-centric pop, which brings us to the Whiskey A Go Go right here. Desperate to be part of that scene, Susanna had Xerox homemade flyers uh, that was advertising for like-minded musicians and she put some of her favorite bands on there like the birds love and the go-go's who happened to be playing here the night she distributed the flyers but i think the most telling tidbit on there was the statement must be nice and i think that tells you all you need to know about susanna hobbs anyways right across the street here was a record store called licorice pizza and uh, susanna put one of her ads up on a community billboard here she got one response and it was from a young lady named Maria McKee, who later went on to form Lone Justice. But they just didn't seem to have enough in common. But that never stopped Susanna from continuing her search to find people that were as ambitious and devoted to that type of music as she was. The Whiskey Go Go. So now we're on Sunset Boulevard in the Echo Park section of Los Angeles. And back in December of 1980, Vicky and Debbie Peterson's band, who was going by the name Those Girls at the time, started falling apart. Their guitar player, Lynn Elkind, had decided to leave and pursue other avenues. But Lynn and the Peterson sisters were still roommates, and uh, what occurred to them the day after John Lennon died can only be described as serendipity. Lynn had placed an ad in the Recycler, which was a classified magazine here in LA, looking for like-minded musicians to start a new band with. And in those days, before cell phones, you shared a telephone for the household. The phone rang and Vicky picked it up and somebody wanted to talk to Lynn about the ad she had placed. And Vicky got to talking to her and they just really hit it off. They were both commiserating about John Lennon's murder the day before. One thing led to another and they all realized that there was a chemistry connection there. And that's how basically Vicki Peterson, Debbie Peterson, and Susanna Hoffs finally came together. So after rehearsing,
living in Susanna's parents' garage with Vicky and Debbie, uh, and eventual bassist Annette Zelinskas, who had been the only person to answer Susanna's ad in the recycler, uh, they decided to do gigs, which, which brings us here. So on June 13th, 1981, the Colors, as they had rebranded themselves, played in the basement here at the United Methodist Church. And if it wasn't their first gig, it was their first advertised gig. They would play places like this wherever they could, usually for friends and the wait staff there. But it was obvious from very early on that they had a very interesting and unique sound, especially in the vocal department. So it wasn't long before the Colors decided to change the name yet again, and they had somehow dug up an article from a vintage 60s era Esquire magazine about a hairdo called the Supersonic Bang. And they loved the name, but soon dropped the supersonic part and became simply the Bangs. And by the way, not only did the Bangs battle the stigma of being a girl band, but in the 1980s it seemed like there was only one girl band per customer, so they had to deal with constantly being compared to the Go-Go's, who other than being female were nothing like them at all. And I think that's why being a major part of the so-called Paisley Underground movement had such a profound effect on the identity of the Bangs. So the Paisley Underground was basically a name given to a small gaggle of LA bands like The Three O'Clock, Rain Parade, Dream Syndicate, and of course The Bangs. And it was a very 60s-centric, jangly guitar, harmony vocal-driven sound. But these bands created a scene by hanging out together and playing gigs and guesting on each other's shows and recordings. And it was all done on various do-it-yourself record labels. And with the punk shows getting ever more violent and the new wave scene playing itself out, it all converged to become the perfect time and the perfect place for a scene like the Paisley Underground to flourish. So now we're just a couple blocks from the beach in Venice, California, in what has got to be the most gentrified neighborhood in all of Los Angeles. This neighborhood used to be pretty rough. But that little house right there used to be the location of Radio Tokyo Studios, and it was run by a gentleman named Ethan James. He was the engineer producer. Pretty legendary place. We're going to go around back and check it out, by the way. So bands like Jane's Addiction, The Minutemen, The Last, all recorded on the 8-track machine in here and of course it's where the Bangs recorded their first record Getting Out of Hand in November of 1981. Some accounts say it took just over three hours and some say it was all day but the end result was the same two minutes of absolute power pop nirvana and in those days if you wanted to release your own record you started your own company and that's exactly what the Bangs did with their Down Kitty record label. In January of 1982, they were able to get DJ Rodney Bingenheimer of local station KROQ to play the record, and it got enough requests to make it go to number three on his top 20 list, and enough attention to start getting local magazines like Flipside and Nomag to do articles about them. But for all intents and purposes, the Bangs took their first giant step out of obscurity right here at Radio Tokyo Studios. By early 1983, the Bangs had hooked up with manager Miles Copeland and recorded a new EP for his Faulty Products label, simply titled The Bangs. Now, Faulty was not a major label, but they weren't a self-distributed one either. But before it could be released, another group called The Bangs in New Jersey had caught wind of their growing popularity and threatened to shut them down unless they gave them $40,000 for the rights to the name. Now, the girls loved the Bangs as their band name and had gone to great pains to make it their brand, but eventually they very reluctantly decided to add an L.E.S. to it and become the Bangles, which brings us here. This is the Sunset Strip Club, the Viper Room. It was formerly called the Central, and after the band had retooled the graphics on their EP to reflect the new Bangles name, they came here and filmed a video for the EP single called The Real World and it garnered them enough underground attention to book appearances on Dick Clark's American Bandstand and MTV's Cutting Edge. Things were moving ever faster, but there was just one more piece of the puzzle that still needed to be found. So 
So by 1983, the Bangles were regulars at music venues like Cafe de Grand, The Music Machine, Club Lingerie, and the Lhasa Club right here on Santa Monica Boulevard. So in May of that year, bassist Annette Zelinskis had decided to leave the band to form cowpunk band Blood on the Saddle. And that left the door open for Michael Mickey Steele to join as the last piece of the puzzle. Back in 1975, Michael, who was a Southern California girl, had answered an ad looking for Girl Singers Wanted. And the ad was placed by none other than L.A. Svengali, Kim Fowley. And of course, the Girl Singers Wanted band turned out to be the Runaways. So she rehearsed and recorded with uh, the earliest version of the Runaways, which was a power trio with uh, Joan Jett and Sandy West, with Mickey singing lead and playing bass, of course. But she soon became disillusioned with it, mainly because of the uber creepy way that uh, Kim Folly was treating her in the band. And she also felt that the song Cherry Bomb was condescending and in her own words, stupid. Anyways, Folly eventually kicked her out of the band and in my opinion, he did her a big favor. But Mickey had to sit on the sidelines and watch the Runaways do what she had always dreamed about. And unfortunately, it was something she had time to ruminate on with the 15 or so other bands that she played with in the meantime. So when Michael caught wind that Vicky and Debbie were looking for a roommate, uh, she did what she called the most calculated thing in her life and uh, moved in knowing full well that they might soon be looking for a bassist with a great voice. In my opinion, it worked out not a whole lot differently than when the Beatles found Ringo Starr. It was that very last important piece that made everything click from there on in. Blossom. So now we're in Hollywood driving up Vine Street, and in 1984, the Bangles released their first major label album called All Over the Place on Columbia. It was recorded at a variety of different studios here, including this one, which used to be Crystal Sound. It's obviously now defunct. But it included the absolutely great single, Hero Takes a Fall. It was written by Vicki Peterson and Susanna Hoft, and I think it really showcased them to a wide audience. And it opened the door for them to open for Cyndi Lauper uh, on a huge tour. But even more importantly, I think it brought them to someone even more important to their careers, someone that would open many more doors, and of course I'm talking about Prince. So in January of 1986, the Bangles released their next record called Different Light, and it was really their breakout record. It contained a couple of worldwide hits, including Manic Monday, who of course Prince wrote. And uh, Prince had written the song a couple years previous. He had originally intended for his protege, Apollonia, and her group to sing it, but for whatever reasons, they had a falling out. In the meantime, Prince had seen their video for Hero Takes a Fall, which they actually filmed up in San Francisco on Market Street, and he absolutely fell in love with it, and he decided to come here to the palace uh, to take him one of the Bangles shows. Susanna remembers that just a couple weeks prior she had first heard When Doves Cry and she was rather amazed that Prince even knew who they were, let alone come and see them play. And he did more than just come and see him play. He strapped on a guitar and did an incredible lead on When Hero Takes a Fall. So Prince told him he had a couple of songs they might like and Susanna drove her beat up Toyota to Sunset Sound where ironically they would eventually record the song but Prince wasn't there and he had put the song on a cassette for them and of course the rest is history and by the way Susanna still has the original cassette Prince made for him anyways Manic Monday made it all the way to number two on the charts and uh, the song that prevented it from going to number one was none other than Kiss by Prince right here Even though Manic Monday didn't hit number one, another single from the album did, and that of course was Walk Like an Egyptian. And to this day, it's still one of the most performed karaoke songs ever, Susanna Hoff's side flicks and all. But the Bangles continued to perform and write songs like In Your Room, and even hit number one again with Eternal Flame, whose inspiration, Susanna says, was the flame burning over Elvis Presley's grave at Graceland. But by late 1989, things had played themselves out and they decided to go their separate ways and didn't record again together as a group until 1999 
when they did Get the Girl for the Austin Powers franchise. They've toured and recorded as the Bangles in one form or another ever since, and although Michael Steele left the group for good in 2005, they now perform with original bassist, and that's Zelenskis. Throughout their careers, the Bangles have received what I feel is an undue amount of flack because as an all-female group that played their own instruments, it was thought of as a gimmick to some people, which is really unfair for a myriad of reasons. But perhaps it somehow contributed to that fuck you, we're going to play like we play, so deal with it attitude that I think they've had from day one. And I can attest to it because I personally saw them play back in the day at Club Lingerie. And if nothing else, this is a really great live band. Anyways, I'd like to thank the Bangles for their incredibly cool story and their great music. And uh, this is the part of the show where I shamelessly ask you to like and subscribe. I would very much appreciate it. And if you like classic rock, uh, we have a library with a bunch of stuff I think that you might appreciate. Anyways, for Tim, I'd like to thank you once again. Keep playing it, keep playing it loud. Peace out.